Today in World Literature, we continue with student presentations. The first group of students worked collaboratively throughout the semester as the Australian and New Zealand study group. How, they ask, is the history of colonization and displacement shared by Australia, North America, and Latin America? And how is this common heritage reflected in the literature of these three regions? To answer these questions regarding Australia and New Zealand, the students turn their attention to Kenneth Sless's South Country, Judith Wright's Bora Ring, and the 1995 film from New Zealand, Once Were Warriors. Good evening. We are the Australia Oceania Group. I'm Ramanan Kumaraju. This is Jim Yankee, Chris Wago, Anna Kasavsky, and Raymond Puppy. Today we'll be talking about I'll be giving the introduction by providing the problem statement. Then Jim will provide a brief description of the geography and history of Australia and New Zealand, followed by Anna's talk on the effect of colonization on native cultures. Chris will then talk about the effect of colonization and displacement on family relationships, which will be followed by Raymond's discussion on the contemporary themes of racism and isolation. What's the problem? Then I will come and wrap up with the conclusion. Now the problem statement. How is the history of colonization and displacement shared by North America, Latin America, and Australia, Oceania? And how is this common heritage reflected in the literature of these three regions? Now Jim will take over to present the geography and history. I'll give a brief overview of the geography of Australia and New Zealand along with uh, some of the information on the <clears throat> inhabitants and also with the colonization of the region. Australia is basically a large flat continent, average elevation around 1,000 feet, average mountain elevation around 4,000 feet. The eastern shore is the most densely populated area with the city of Sydney in this area also. The central section, which is here, is a harsh, desolate terrain, sparsely populated and known as the outback. The native inhabitants are the aborigines, and they migrated from the Southeast Asia around 40,000 years ago. They're nomadic hunters that use villages as base camps. They were known to walk softly on the earth, practice water conservation, and only use what they needed. They developed cultural traits and ecological knowledge that showed an impressive adaptation to the Australian environment. Different tribes were uniquely integrated, and multilingualism was common. With more than, by the 19th century, 200 distinct languages existed. New Zealand, in contrast, is generally mountainous and is separated by two islands, the North Island and the South Island. The North Island is known by the irregular coastline, the, most, the northern plains being the most populous, with the city of Auckland being the center of commerce. The South Island has the large mountain range with the average peaks around 10,000 feet, and most of the population relies in the Canterbury Plains. The native inhabitants, who are believed to be the Maori, migrated to the island in the 9th century. They may not have been the first. Legend has it that there was another dark-skinned people, the Moriori, that inhabited the island. These people were very adept at hunting the moa, the creature cited in the Alan Kurnow poem. And skeleton currently resides in the Christ Church Museum. The Maori settled in the North Island along the coast. The Dutch and the Portuguese were the first to venture into the region, but deemed it too desolate for colonization. It wasn't until the British expansion during the Age of Reason that the Brits saw as their divine right <clears throat> to civilize the world. The region was colonized following Captain Cook's explorations of this area in 1768, and with the first colony established as a penal colony following the American Revolution in 1783. Sydney was founded in 1787. Regional colonization had different effects on the native inhabitants of Australia and New Zealand. The Maori of New Zealand experienced violent uprisings, eventually assimilated into the culture with some retaining some of their native traits, such as the language. The Aborigines, on the other hand, were pushed farther and farther out as convict labor was used to fuel commerce and also to entice colonization. Limited resources eventually displaced the Aborigines, and the culture and people were almost completely decimated. One simple, one symbol stands in the outback as the physical and cultural birthplace of the Aborigines. This is Ayers Rock. The Kenneth Slesser poem, South Country, best describes the despair 
and isolation associated with the colonization of Australia and the eventual demise of the Aboriginal culture. While even the dwindled hills are small and bare, as if rebellious, buried, pitiful, something below pushed up a knob of skull, feeling its way to air. As it was mentioned in the introduction, the goal of this presentation is to draw parallels between histories of Australia, Latin America, and North America as reflected in the literature of respective regions. One such parallel can be drawn between the effect of colonization on the native cultures of the above regions. We know from American history that American Indians were treated poorly by the colonizers. Tribes were uprooted, moved from their lands, and people killed and abused. The situation was somewhat similar in Australia and Latin America as well. First, I'd like to turn to the poem Boring by Judith Wright. Um, in this poem, she uses various techniques to help Freddy really visualize the corroboree, the sacred ritual of Aborigines. We can almost see how everything was before the colonizers took over. And through the whole poem, the theme of lamentation reminds us about the culture once alive but destroyed. The song is gone, the dance is secret with the dancers in the earth, the ritual useless, and the tribal story lost in the alien tale. This poem is the most famous of its kind that deals with the loss of Aboriginal culture. Another piece that I wanted to discuss was The Death of the Tiger by Rosaria Castellanos. This is a Latin American piece. It's a story of a Balmatic tribe. Uh, these people were once proud and belligerent, but were forced into poverty by the colonizers. They used to live high up on the mountains, but were forced to go down into the valley. But there they began a precarious life in which the memory of past greatness slowly vanished and history became a dying fire that no one was capable of rekindling. There is no better way to express the grief of realizing that yet another tradition has just died. Yes. Anna just spoke about how Australian literature parallels Latin American literature. And I got to complete uh, these parallels within our class uh, by extending New Zealand literature uh, and paralleling that to the literature of North America. The vehicle that I'm going to use to talk about is a film called Once Were Warriors, which was made in 1995 by the Maori director Lee Tamahori. The film centers on domestic violence and alcoholism as a result of cultural intrusion. It's about a Mary family living in a Mary ghetto. The father's name is Jake Hecka, which is uh, ironic because Hecka is the name of the first Mary chief who was defeated by the English in the Mary Wars of the mid-19th century. In Beloved, Seth appears to love anyone too much. This is a result of, of slavery uh, setting up in such a condition where at any moment, a uh, slave owner can take away somebody that Setha loves. Therefore, it's too much of a jeopardy in order to give too much of herself. A negative aspect that we see in the film from New Zealand is Jake Hecka being his wife. Although this is a more destructive reaction than Setha's, uh, it's stemming from a similar cause. This is a result of poor conditions that the Maori tribe are forced into by uh, the Anglo colonizers the loss of identity in the family. In the film Once for Warriors, uh, Jake the father is a poor role model to his sons, so they have to find role models in traditional non-Western Mary groups. The oldest son finds a role model in a Mary biker gang, which winds up being a positive influence on his life. The younger son finds himself in a Mary reform school that he's sent to after he gets in trouble with the law. In Joe Turner's Come and Gone, people seek their own song which is a metaphor for their own identity. Uh, Joe Turner looks for his wife throughout the film, <laughs> throughout the, uh, the piece, but winds up realizing that he's seeking his own song or his identity. Now Ray's gonna take over. My name is Ray and I'm gonna talk about uh, the themes of isolation in Australian literature. Uh, we all know that Australia is physically isolated from the rest of the world, but uh, you may not know about some of the other aspects of its isolation. Australia's culture is derived from the British uh, who settled there and colonized the area and pushed out the uh, original people, the Aborigines. Um, 
In fact, Australia had an all-white immigration policy up until the year 1966, and its aboriginal, uh, uh, the people who, their original people, the aborigines, weren't even given the right to vote until 1967. Uh, these policies helped to keep uh, the Australian culture not only isolated internally from its own native people, but externally from the rest of the world and any other you know, exposure to other cultures. Um, Bruce Daw, in his poem, Migrants, uh, in line 10 and 11, their children, now less often, came red-eyed home from school. He's saying there is that uh, once these immigrants did come in, uh, there was a, a period of adjustment which is still ongoing, a time when nobody was accepted uh, into the schools and now this is becoming a little bit more accepted, the people that are coming in that aren't white or Caucasian are being accepted more. And the schools can be seen as uh, schools being an institution of a country, being accepted into the institutions of the country more and more, but still it's not perfect there. In the last line of the poem, uh, as it pulsed up in rich wells from underground, I see as an allusion by uh, Daw to Ayers Rock, which we have seen as a, a symbol of the isolation of Australia. Uh, in the context of this poem and uh, the contemporary uh, changes Australia has gone through with regard to immigration, we see that Ayers Rock is, is a symbol of it's Australia's physical and geographical isolation, but also has some other themes, isolation of the Aboriginal people to the outback, isolation of Australia itself culturally through its white immigration policies. Uh, so when we, when we think of Ayers Rock, we can think of it as more of a, a symbol of many things. And now uh, uh, Ramanan will wrap it up. As we have seen, North America, Latin America, and Australia, Oceania, they share a history, common history of colonization and dislocation and displacement of indigenous cultures, which is manifested in the literature from these three regions. Themes of disintegration of family structure are common in the stories of white oppression from all these three regions. The destruction of native cultures is reflected in the themes of loss found in Judith Wright's Bora Ring and Rosario Castellano's Death of the Tiger. Finally, we conclude by saying that similar themes of cultural integration and racism are found in the works from all these three regions, and now the works cited. Most of the works that we took were from our textbook, One World of Literature. It, it had a magnificent variety of works, and so we thought we would use it. And Toni Morrison's Beloved was used by Chris to contrast between the family relations in New Zealand and North America. Lee Tamhori's Once Were Warriors was the, a nice picture which was uh, used again by Chris. And all the pictures that we have received were uh, we used were taken from National Geographic Society's special publication season magazine. Thank you. If you have any We continue our student presentations with a review of methods of literary study. Our students seek the most promising methods of literary analysis, one that would help them understand Gabriel Garcia Marquez's love in the time of cholera. They review Marxist criticism, feminist criticism, archetypal criticism, and psychoanalytic criticism, acknowledging the strengths and weaknesses in these methods. Note near the end of the presentation that the men in the group favor psychoanalytic criticism while Shlipa Patel rebuttals with her advocacy of feminist criticism. Okay, first up, Marxist criticism. I'm going to start with the background of Marxist criticism. Then I'm going to move on to Marxist criticism of love in the time of cholera. Marxist criticism were named, was named for Karl Marx, a German philosopher and economist during the 1800s. Uh, Marxist criticism with, is a form of historical criticism which studies works in the historical context a Marxist sees history as a struggle between so social economic classes and literature as a product of economic forces. Its perspective is in economics. Everything is spawned from an economic base, law, politics, religion, and of course, literature. Granville Hicks, who was an American Marxist critic during the 1930s said, literature must reflect the class struggle. Marxist critic's job in reading is to change the world by revealing economic basis of the arts. Now I want to look at a Marxist criticism of love in the time of cholera. The story as seen by a Marxist 
would probably say uh, it might see it as a love story, but it would also mostly see it as a struggle between social economic classes. The origin of the characters are from different classes. Dr. Urbino certainly being from the upper class, Fermina Daza from the Nouveau Riche class, and lastly, Florentino Ariza from the lower class. Was Lower in the Time of Cholera a love story? I think the Marxist critic would fail to recognize it as a love story, but as a struggle, again, between social economic classes. Uh, the Marxist anal analysis of the whole story, it would see the economics of the time and the characters representative of their classes. We're now going to move on to feminist criticism presented by Shubhra Patel. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, my name is Shobha Patel, and I'll be doing the feminist criticism. First, we'll start with the background of feminist criticism. Uh, feminist criticism is a form of gender criticism. It grew out of the women's uh, movement of the 1960s. The definition of uh, feminist criticism is that it's an approach especially concerned with analyzing the depiction of, female, of women in literature. Um, how would the feminist criticism view love in the time of cholera? It is a love story. Um, as you can see that there is no recognition of suppression of women in the story. Um, now I'll move into the view of each character by the feminist criticism. Uh, the first one that I'll do is for Mina Daza. For Mina Daza is a faithful wife, a good wife. She's, her role in this story is a traditional wife. Um, she respects her husband, um, although she was in love with uh, Florentino Riza. But she has forgotten. I, she has put that in aside when she married uh, Dr. Urbino. Um, now I'll move to Dr. Juvenal Urbino. Dr. Urbino is a well-respected man, but he did not pay much much attention to his wife. Um, there was not enough uh, love in their marriage. There was a lot of respect for each other in the marriage, but there was not enough love in the marriage, which probably I think was the reason why uh, after he passed away, it was the reason why Florentino. Uh, Fermina Daza went back to Florentino uh, Ariza. Now I'll move into for Florentino Ariza. Florentino Ariza in this is not a man of in integrity. Um, his love for Fermina, uh, Fermina Daza survived for 50, 51 years, but is it love? Because this man had 622 liaisons with dif uh, different women, and that just, to me, it's, it's not love. Uh, I view it as lust for women, not, not love. Although this story is a love story, but there there is a there is a sense of lust for in this story, not only by I think um, Florentino Ariza, but also for Mina Daza, when when her husband passed away, she she immediately went to Florent uh, Florentino Ariza, and um, I think as you see it in the uh, in as you go on in the story, I think they had um, sex right after I think the second day or something when they right after his death. And to sum it a lot, to sum it up, uh, feminist criticism of this story is that it is a love story, but there is no, I think there is no love between Florentino Ariza and, and uh, Fermina Daza. It's just, there's just too much lust in this story and not love. Thank you. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Frank, who will talk about archetypal criticism. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Shilpa. I'll be discussing archetypal criticism. Archetypal criticism is very challenging, but yet it is also very limited. It concentrates on one central theme or idea and, de and can't develop itself further. The literary definition for archetypal criticism is an image or symbol that functions as a primary source of or emerging place for unconscious and subconscious meanings shared collectively by groups of people with common histories and backgrounds. Looking at the story, we know that the common theme and background in love in the time of cholera is the theme of love. If you'd want to take it even further, it, you would be extending yourself from archetypal criticism. You could probably, if you take the theme of love even deeper, you'd probably be going into deconstructive criticism. You might possibly be going into biographical or historical criticism. It's very limited, but yet challenging. Its quest is to involve the testing and initiation of a hero, and thus initially represent the movement from innocence to experience. The hero in love in the time of cholera is Florentino Ariza. One literary critic went on to say of, so far as this is Florentino's story, we find ourselves as he earns the suspension of our disbelief, cheering him on, wishing for the success of this stubborn warrior against age and death, 
all in the name of love. Subliminally, as reading this, you might not want to find Florentino Ariza as a hero because of your disbelief because of his liaisons. What archetypal criticism allows us to do, one of its major advantages, is invites us to use comparisons. Perhaps a common comparison with Love in a Time of Cholera is a novel written by Toni Morrison known as Beloved. A common genre used between both stories is a terminology used as Buildings Roman. What Buildings Roman is, it's a coming of age novel. In Beloved, there is a character known Denver who happens to lack much security and self esteem. As the story progresses, as the story progresses, we see her coming of age as well. In Love in the Time of Cholera, Florentino, we watch him come to age as well as the story moves on. And also a noteworthy comparison between both novels is the use of a mantra. <coughs> what a mantra is, a mantra is, suggests many numerical possibilities. In the story of Morrison's Beloved, the significance of the number seven was used several times. For once, the home address, 124, if you add one plus two plus four, we get the summation of seven. There are also several references in Beloved to the significance of Sunday, which we all know is the seventh day. Also, there is a character named Sixo in the story. As he is being burned down to death, he's yelling this, his son's name out and hollering 7-0. The mantra that I have pinpointed in Love in the Time of Cholera would be the specific use when he mentions 51 years, 9 months, and 4 days. Two disadvantages that have to be concentrated in archetypal criticism. Its emphasis on ancient themes has made it very vulnerable. It gives us many different interpretations because of its broadness. If you want to follow into archetypal criticism, you better be very, very <coughs> persuasive. Northrop Fry was known as being perhaps the best archetypal critic of our time. His work, The Anatomy of Criticism, written in 1957, is perhaps his most pronounced work regarding criticisms in general. Now we'll turn it over to Vishal, who will be discussing the psychoanalytical criticisms of Love in the Time of Power. Psychoanalysis is based on the observation that individuals are often unaware of many of the factors that determine their emotions and behavior. These unconscious factors may create unhappiness sometimes in form of recognizable symptoms and at other times as troubling personality traits, difficulties in work or in love, relationships, or disturbances in mood and self-esteem. Freud was one of the greatest psychoanalysts whose contribution has been enormous to our society. Freud divided the state of human mind into three basic forms. The first is id, the second is ego, and the third is superego. For him, the definition of id is as follows. It is also known as libido, that is the sexual energy. It is most prim primitive force that governs human nature. It demands immediate gratification. It can be defined as everything pleasurable. It can also be defined as the energy of sexuality. Ego. It is ruled by the reality principle. With formation of ego, the individual becomes a self instead of an amalgam amalgamation of urges and needs. Examples of ego are consciousness, reason response, personality, and behavior. Superego uses guilt, self-reproach as its primary means of enforcement for rules and regulations. Examples of superego are shame, conscience, guilt, morality, religion, aspiration, self-esteem. Let's use these tools to better understand the novel Love in the Time of Cholera by Garcia Marquez. The three characters in novel are Florentino, Fermina Daza, and Juvenal Urbino. Florentino is a character controlled by the id. He is aggressive and likes to satisfy his sexual desires. He is driven by impulses and sexual drives to approach Fermina, Fermina Daza over and over again. Fermina Daza. She's a strongly, uh, she's strongly under the influence of her ego. She believes in reality principle. She loved Florentino, but gets married to Dr. Juvenal Urbino. She marries Do Dr. Juvenal Urbino for his qualities and personality, which are more real than the love of Florentino. Dr. Juvenal Urbino, a person driven by his superego, always fighting the id in him. He struggles over his desires for his patients because of his strong belief in ethics and morals. Here we can see how psychoanalysis works and how we can use these tools to better analyze the novels. Now, Dillis will take over. 
I just want to present the conclusion, or I should say a conclusion. Um, first, I want to start by summarizing what we've discussed uh, in an effective way uh, to determine which criticism is most effective in, in looking at uh, love in the time of cholera. Um, first, what I want to start with is the Marxist criticism. Um, as Glenn said, uh, not very deep when you're talking about love. Um, it's more of uh, an economic criticism, a historical criticism, maybe even a political criticism and a social criticism. Um, uh, now I'll move on to feminist criticism. Um, you would figure as a love story that the feminist criticism would be the best way to go. Um, however, this story, I really didn't find too much love in this story. I found more lust uh, than anything and neglect, things like that. Um, you know, it really, it really goes into the to the stereotypical role of the male and the female. Uh, for the male, it indicates a lustful, loveless person, lustful as uh, um, Florentino Ariza, and uh, loveless as Juvenal Urbino. Um, and it, then it goes into the stereotypical, uh, stereotypical look at the female role, um, being in a marriage where you know, there's really not a lot of love, but she's just there, I don't maybe to cook and clean, things like that. Uh, really backward view. Um, uh, next is the archetypal criticism. Um, it's a very, very broad criticism um, to analyze myth mythical aspects. I mean, you have so many, you have so many different spectrums you can look from. Um, it's very difficult. Um, well, I shouldn't say difficult, that's probably the wrong word. Uh, challenging, as Frank said, would be the word, because it's, it's something, it's a criticism that you can tackle, you can do it, but it's, it, it's very thought-provoking. Um, it takes a lot of time, and there's a lot of, you know, if you, miss, if you miss a certain aspect of the mythological part, you know, you miss the whole thing. It's really, um, it's really an identity, you're really identifying uh, a meaning or a theme. You really, you're really not analyzing it. Um, now I want to move on to the psychoanalytical criticism, um, which would probably be the best criticism for this, for this novel. Um, it's a love story, and what better, what better thing for a love story than a psychoanalytical criticism that examines, that examines love and human behavior and the changes in human behavior spurred by love and things of that nature. Um, uh, I mean, even, I guess you could say love, uh, or Florentino Reeds' warped sense of love uh, would be more like it for my taste. In conclusion, uh, by using these four methods of criticism, you really get a, a, broader, a broader look at, um, at an analyzation of this novel, uh, which is better for the reader um, it, it presents a better, a better understanding of the themes behind a book, the meanings. Um, however, for this, despite what we've concluded on this particular novel, um, you know, you really, you really can't, you know, just look at say, hey, Marx's criticism was no good for this, so I'm never going to use that. Uh, you know, different stories in, entail different criticisms to get the best view. Mm -hmm.